it was later that evening when you were searching before the weather came in. Um, did you find anything that evening? Yes, sir. Um, I didn't really... I mean, I, I knew where Mike's boat was, and I didn't really want to be the one that found it. I would rather somebody else have found it, but my dad was just real determined. And, um, you know, he, uh, we, he took us to a spot. I knew he was going to be there, but he took us to a spot, and sure enough, there was Mike's boat. So we found his boat, um, and... Um, I think we just left it. We didn't touch it. We left it where it was and went back in and told the whoever the law enforcement people were there at the time. But shortly thereafter, a pretty bad storm, rainstorm, and I think cold front came through that night. And did you go back to the lake the next day? Hmm. I'm sure. I'm sure I did. I, the the next. Two months were kind of a blur for me, but yes, I I spent lots of time at the lake during the search um, because I kind of wanted to monitor what was going on. I wanted to put up a good, you know, front to look like I was out there looking like everybody else. Um, but uh, I was I was out there a lot. At some point, a um, hat was found on the lake. Is that not? A hat? Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, were you the one that found that hat? I was not the one that found it. Um, I was the one that put it in the water um, during one of my searches on the lake. I was, well, Denise and I were getting concerned that nothing else was being found out there. Um, and I I was hoping that his waders and jacket and all would be found to kind of confirm that, that he had drowned there. Um, and I wanted to keep the searchers in that particular area. So uh, I took a hat that was similar to a hat that, that Mike used, which was real distinctive. It had a weird-looking bill on it and stuff. And when I was out there... Uh, with another friend of mine, um, I threw it in the water in that area because I wanted to keep the people in that area because I wanted the waders and the jacket to be found to confirm that that's where Mike was and where he went into the water. What was that hat eventually found? It was. And you were asked to identify it? Yes, sir. You told law enforcement it was Mike? It yes, sir. You brought up a point about you and Denise had concerns. All right, we're talking at that point. Mm -hmm. Following Mike's murder on the 16th, what communication did you have with Denise? I can't remember the first time that we talked. Um, we had prearranged that obviously our communication needed to be minimal, um, both by phone and, and in person. Obviously, we weren't going to be meeting up in parking lots and having sex and doing all that was normal for us to be doing. So we had decided that, um, is this too close to me? You can push back a little bit. It's a little louder now than it used to be. It feels like I'm at a concert. But, um, so we had, we had decided uh, ahead of time that we really needed to minimize our contact. Um, I got a lot of information about Denise and what was going on with Denise through Kathy, who was going over to her house and, and seeing her and talking to her. Denise kind of sequestered herself up in her bedroom and uh, didn't want to be around a lot of people uh, during that time, which was smart of her to do. Um, and, uh, and so I got a lot of information from Kathy, but eventually, you know, she and I talked. Um, and there never was a conversation that was like, well, did it all go according to plan? Or, you know, we, first of all, I didn't want to talk about that because that was not the plan. What happened with Mike was not the plan that Denise and I had come up with. Um, and I... Let me stop you right there. I want to make it clear. The plan didn't play out the way you wanted to, but it certainly was it the plan that you and Denise had discussed to actually have him 
killed. The plan was for his death to occur, but it was not for it to occur in the way that it did. I mean, the plan was for him to fall in the water and for him to have a chance to survive it. Um, but obviously that's not what happened, and I didn't want to tell Denise that. Um, so we never had a conversation that was like, uh, did it all go according to plan? But it was quite obvious from the circumstances that Mike was gone and, you know, she assumed that what we talked about, the plan that we had made, she assumed that that was what had happened. It wasn't until years later that I tried to and somewhat told her that that's not what ended up happening. Okay. So at some point you and her started talking again despite the distances. When was that? Um, the, the first time... Oh, I'd be guessing. I mean, I would say a few days uh, before we talked. I'm sure the first time we talked was just on the phone. It was it was a little while before I saw her in person because I remember being kind of nervous, um, and and uh, I just knew it would be weird to see her because of what we had done. Um, I just knew it would be weird to see her after that, kind of to face each other after that. But um, but you know, as the search went on and you know, long term, as things got back to normal, we just kind of settled back into the same routines. But the next thing, obviously, that we had to deal with was the fact that his body wasn't being found. Um, and so the concern between she and I then became, um, well, if his body's not found, what's going to happen with the life insurance? Okay. Is the conversation you're having with her? Yes. Okay. And what is she saying? What is her concern? Well, that if his body's not found, you know, what's going to happen? Is she going to get the money or not? Um, Did you and or her take any steps to facilitate that? <clears throat> to facilitate her getting the money? Yeah. I was not in a hurry to push that issue. I felt like we needed to kind of lay low on that and not appear to be, you know, the eager widow ready to cash in on her life insurance. Also, she was getting, uh, at that time, um, insurance companies were paying a ridiculous amount, I think 8% they were required to pay on death uh, benefit proceeds, so she was earning 8% as long as the money sat there, which you couldn't get that outside uh, in a bank or anything like that. So I knew the longer it drug out, the better it was going to be, and we talked about that. Um, <laughs> Again, it was actually again it was actually my dad because he was concerned about Denise and he wanted her to get her money so she could pay her bills and uh, you know he he pushed he pushed it through um, the hoops that that uh, needed to happen for her to to end up getting the money quickly as she could but. What we came to learn, what he came to learn, what we all came to learn was she was going to have to get a death certificate issued by a judge through a court. Um, so probably my dad or me uh, hooked her up with an attorney, uh, Kurt Hunter, and uh, she talked with Kurt about what needed to be done. Um, and I think basically she had to file a petition uh, with a court stating everything that happened, talking about what a wonderful marriage she had with Mike. There was no reason for him to run off on her. Um, I can't remember what all had to go in the petition, but we talked about that um, ahead of time. And um, she ended up filing a petition, and it, it was granted, and she was issued a death certificate, so she was able to get the money. conversations about what had happened? About what had happened specifically with Mike? Yes. No. Okay. At some point, law enforcement takes other looks at the cases and interviews people. Um, did y'all have any conversations about that? Well, this was years later, and a lot transpired in between 
Mike's death and law enforcement getting involved. I think it was three years later, maybe. Um, but um, the first the first thing that happened with me was I just got a call uh, from a deputy. I don't remember if it was a Jackson County Sheriff Officer or a uh, investigator with FDLE, but I got a call from somebody and they wanted to talk to me about Mike Williams and the case, and um, I agreed and uh, went in to FDLE uh, on Riggins Road there and interviewed uh, with two uh, gentlemen there. And it became quite clear to me during that interview um, that they were suspicious uh, of what happened, and not only that, they were suspicious of me and Denise. Um, and I think even after I left that interview, uh, I called her immediately and was freaking out, um, you know, that, that this was going on. And, uh, right there. So you've gone in, you've done an interview. You mentioned that there were things, a lot of things that happened prior to that. Um, and this is approximately 2003, 2004, something like that? Yes, sir. Interview? Right. So prior to that occurring, um, had you and Denise talked about a possibility of what you would do if law enforcement started investigating this? Yeah, I mean, we basically weren't going to say anything. We had the, the way that we, the word that we put on it was we had an agreement uh, that she would never say anything about me and I would never say anything about her because we knew or we felt like um, that as long as neither one of us talked that nobody would ever, you know, find out what happened. Um, so we, we called it our agreement. Um, basically, and um, and we were probably pretty arrogantly confident in that agreement, I guess. Did you and her take any steps to ensure the fact that wiretaps or um, having a conversation with her, code words, code signals, things like that? We... Um, we didn't get that way until after law enforcement started looking into things. The other thing that that um, made us really paranoid was uh, Denise. At first, Denise was allowing Cheryl, Mike's mom, uh, to see Ansley and taking Ansley, Mike and Denise's daughter, Ansley, out to Cheryl, Grandma Cheryl's house. And um, on one of those trips out to... Uh, Cheryl's house, um, Denise found a notebook that Cheryl had and she had written uh, her suspicions about Denise and me and uh, what had happened with Mike and, and when Cheryl was in another room or something, Denise read that um, and came back and told me what she had read and, and really freaked out about it and um, at that point didn't want uh, uh, Cheryl to, didn't want any contact with Cheryl really. Um, but um, between that and, and law enforcement getting involved, uh, we became very paranoid about uh, being monitored. So we agreed and talked about we weren't going to talk about anything on the phones anymore. Um, we were worried about our cars being bugged, our houses being bugged. Um, we had hand signals that we would use if we needed to talk about something related to Mike or law enforcement. Um, um, one of them was a C for Cheryl, and then the other one was this, like jail bars. Um, so when we did that, we knew that one or the other of us had something to talk about, and we would usually go, there was a park next to, there is a park next to Denise's house, um, along Mixtucky Road, we would go out to that park and go way out in a field on a bench and uh, we would leave our cars in the vehicle, wouldn't take, no. we would leave our phones in the vehicle, uh, make sure we didn't have a phone on us. We were, we were very concerned that we were being watched or monitored by law enforcement. Now backing up again prior to the interview, um, you're still married in 2000 to Kathy and you start your relations back with Denise. Um, at some point, did your marriage with Kathy start falling apart? Yes, sir. Um, I mean, it 
had started, it had started, you know, when Denise and I started our affair in 97, but uh, after, after Mike was gone, um, we actually, Kathy and I, spent even more time with Denise, um, the three of us doing a lot of things, just because Denise and I wanted to be together. Um, and, uh, and yeah, things just got worse and worse. I mean, Kathy, you know, told me later, you know, that after Mike was gone, it was like there was no reason for me and Denise to be apart from each other. She made comments like that, but um, I think she was suspicious of us, you know, all along. But I never admitted to Kathy that Denise and I were having an affair, obviously, and um, and that was just kind of basically the next step in the plan. But it couldn't be right off because that would look bad. So. Uh, Kathy and I ended up staying together. Um, I think our divorce wasn't finalized until 2004, I believe. At some point, did you and Kathy separate prior to the divorce? Yes, sir. At some point, was there a situation where you backtracked, essentially, and started and made a pledge to try and get back with Kathy? Um, and not go with it. Yes, sir. What, there, what was that about? There was a lot that led up to that. Um, as, as you said, we were separated. Um, so Kath, Kathy and I were separated. Uh, I had a house to myself. Um, there was the incident that you talked about, we talked about earlier with uh, Angela Stafford, where Denise walked in on Angela and I in my bedroom. Um, after that happened, Denise was furious, um, and she, you know, we had a briefcase full of mementos, cards, notes, letters, pictures, videos, all sorts of things. She left my house and went to her house and burned it all. Um, she was very angry with me. Um, I didn't know it at the time, but she actually was having sex with a guy that she worked with um, uh, at work. And I think when she caught me with it, I'm sorry? Yes, sir. Um, and so when she caught me with Angela, uh, I think she decided at that point, well, I'm going to drop Brian and pursue a relationship with Mr. Bunker. Um, and so things just basically like went to hell with me and Denise. Um, and long story short, I, I mean, I just realized what a disaster my life was at that point. And Denise and I had, well, we hadn't broken up. She had basically dumped me for Chuck. And... I found myself at church one day on July 4th, um, heard a sermon about freedom. Um, you know, I felt like I was a slave to all that I had been living for, you know, in my relationship with Denise. And I had a, um, I guess you would call it a spiritual awakening or conversion, however you want to term it. Um, eventually, the relationship with Denise and Mr. Bunker went haywire and south. Um, they had their legal issues with each other. Um, Let's stop there real quick because you're on Mr. Bunker. Was there an incident between you and Mr. Bunker? That happened prior to me going to church that day, but yes, sir. Uh, the way that I found out about Denise and Chuck uh, was uh, she <clears throat> left town with him I uh, went up to Atlanta on a trip trip together, um, and I found out from one of her sisters that they were in Atlanta, and I was not happy. I was angry, um, and I wanted to confront her, you know, because we had been through a lot, done a lot for each other. I mean, uh, I gave up half of my son's life to be with her. Um, you know, killed her husband, uh, uh, and we'd done a lot to be together, and then for her to turn around and uh, go, uh, 
you know, sleep with Chuck didn't make me happy. So I, uh, I found out they were in Buckhead in Atlanta, and I drove up there to confront them, confront her. Um, I didn't really care about him so much, but um, I ended up finding, uh, I ended up sitting in a lobby in a hotel, and they came strolling by uh, together. And, um, you know, I confronted them, and we ended up going outside and having a long argument, uh, conversation uh, out next to the street uh, in Buckhead. She, I wanted Chuck gone. I didn't want to deal with Chuck. Uh, so my main focus was you need to get rid of Chuck. Um, she uh, got rid of him, got him to leave us alone. And uh, she and I uh, spent the night together in the hotel. Um, and I didn't know it at the time, but she was just kind of placating me when Chuck was, I think, got a room down the hallway in the hotel, uh, didn't really leave. Um, but uh, so we had that incident. Um, and uh, Denise told me later that uh, the way that she got rid of Chuck was uh, she told him that uh, if he didn't leave, that uh, I could have her turned in for insurance fraud which I thought was just, it blew my mind that she told him that. I, I couldn't believe that she admitted that to another party. Um, Did you hear her say that, or is that just what she told you? She told me this later, and we argued about it later. Um, so the incident with Chuck happened, and I drove back to Tallahassee, and, and I was just done. I was just spent. And that's what kind of led me to kind of, I guess, <laughs> what I thought at the time was rock bottom. I didn't know I had so many rock bottoms ahead of me. But um, at that point, I ended up in church and, and uh, kind of had a spiritual reawakening. And over the next few months, I decided that uh, I, I wanted to try to reconcile with Kathy. Um, I still loved Denise. I still wanted to be with Denise. Um, eventually, Denise and Chuck's relationship imploded, um, and they had their, you know, legal issues and whatnot. And uh, so they broke up. My dad actually helped Denise uh, through all of that. Um, so they break up. You tried to get back with Kathy. They broke up and. And Denise and I, Denise kind of had her own spiritual awakening. And this sound, I know this sounds all screwy, but um, we wanted to be together still, but we both agreed that the right thing for me to do was to try to get with Kathy. And if Kathy decided that wasn't going to happen, then we were free to be together. Um, Is that what you did? And so, yes, I tried to reconcile with Kathy. Um, Did that work out? <laughs> yeah, not well. Um, Eventually, you and Kathy end up in a divorce. Yes, sir. We ended up getting divorced. Um, and so, we're free to be together. When, Mike's, was, the, when was the divorce with Kathy? I'm, this is terrible, but I, but I don't remember when it was finalized because we had a long separation. I don't remember when the divorce itself was finalized. At some point, did you and Denise start becoming public with your dating? Yes, sir. Um, after the divorce was finalized and we decided enough time had passed from Mike's death, um, we, uh, we decided it was okay for us to gradually uh, start dating and... Uh, you know, we talked about it with a lot of people. There were some people that took it well. Uh, there were some people uh, like her family and her dad who took it horribly. Um, but um, we did start dating. Um, Eventually you got married. And then we got married uh, in 2005. 
Um, we were still concerned about the law enforcement side of it, but as time passed and nothing happened, we became less and less concerned about it. Um, you say that you're still concerned. Did y'all have communications to, between each other on um, about what would you do if law enforcement ever interviewed? Right. Um, the, you know, things would come up in the media. We would see things online or in the news. Uh, Cheryl, uh, you know, never gave up. And um, kept pushing things. And um, so from time to time, that issue would be raised. Um, and I always wanted to talk about things a lot more than Denise. Denise did not like to talk about anything uh, related to that, usually. Um, but we, you know, we would typically not talk in the house. We would typically talk, you know, out at Lake Ella or a public place or wherever where we felt like we weren't being monitored, uh, even at that point. Um, and did y'all have an agreement, the PAC, the agreement not to talk to law enforcement? Yes, I mean, we promised each other uh, that neither one of us would ever say anything. <clears throat> because we knew the only way that, that we felt like the only way they would get anything would be if one of us talked. And, I mean, I, I, I was concerned about Denise, if she ever got under that pressure, whether she would hold up to it or not. Um, you know, Kathy actually warned me, uh, I think the first time I heard uh, uh, Kathy talk about it, um, she said, you know, you, Kathy was trying to get me to talk, but uh, basically she said, you know you can't trust Denise and she'll throw you under the bus the first chance she gets. Would it be fair to say that you made assurances to her that being Denise that you had not told anybody else about this particular case? Yes, sir. And did she make assurances to you that she had not told anybody else? The only person I knew of was, was Mr. Bunker, but, you know, she didn't say that Mike was murdered or anything like that. She just supposedly... Sure, part. Right. Now, 2016, you were, uh, there was the kidnapping arrest. Yes, sir. And following that, <clears throat> you confessed to the murder of Mike, correct? Yes, sir. You read, led law enforcement to his remains. Yes, sir. The conversations with Denise they, leading up to the murder, did they occur in Leon County for the most part? Yes, sir. The conversations with Denise following the murder where the agreement was never to talk to law enforcement, did that occur in Leon County, Florida? Yes, sir. Whenever she set up her alibi to stay at home and make phone calls, did that occur in Leon County, Florida? Yes, sir. We talked a lot about Denise Winchester, or Williams, formerly Winchester. Do you see her here in the courtroom today? Yes, sir. Can you please point to her and indicate an article of clothing? An article of clothing? The pink sweater? So we had talked with the uh, I had talked with the attorneys earlier and decided that it was too late to start into the cross examination by the defense. It's not fair to make them go a little while and then break up their cross examination. So I hope it doesn't break your heart. But we're going to break for the evening. Um, it's pretty reasonable time. Um, just leave your notes where they are. Um, don't discuss the case with anyone. Don't let anyone discuss the case with you. Let's stay off the internet and the social media. Don't review any media accounts of what's going on here. Let's be back tomorrow at 8.45. Um, and so we can get started promptly with this. Um, parking arrangement will be the same, so they'll bring you up the back way. Now, somebody ended up over here, and that, I don't know exactly who. Don't, don't go to the front of the courtroom. Come to the back so we can get you in the jury room. Don't need to be hanging out over here with the witnesses and, and so forth. 
uh, make sure before they leave everybody's clear on where they're coming and uh, what the plan is. Anybody confused or have an issue about? Uh, if not, we'll let you step out with the bailiff. We'll see you all tomorrow morning, 845. Just leave your notes where they are. Everybody be seated. Right. Uh, any issues from either side? No, I'm saying no. You're on a road. We have a moment. I know you were interested in getting advanced notice of special jury instructions. Correct. We, and, and, and I just discovered one issue that I didn't think of before. Uh, the standard jury instruction on, on, excuse me, on accessory after the fact doesn't have anything in it about the immunity in the statute for husband and wife. And if you look at the statute, the statute requires the state to prove that uh, the parties are not in the position of husband and wife. Uh, and in this case, the, if you look at the dates in the indictment, there, there, uh, there's a period of time in which they were married. There's a period of time in the indictment that is after their marriage. Uh, so, I think what we're going to need to do, and I don't mean to give you a full scale argument, I, I can have something for you tomorrow. I just, my, my intention now is just. I, I thought a, that was, that applied only if it was a third degree felony. Oh, my, that could, you know, that could be all. My, my recollection of looking at it, and I did consider that issue, but I think that, I think in the jury instructions they specify it's a, that this only applies if it's not a third degree felony. Um, well, if that's the case, Your Honor, that'll resolve the problem. I'll, I'll take a look at it again and, uh, and make sure, but I didn't want to omit that if it was something that we needed to do. Right. If you look at 777.03, the accessory after the fact. 1A um, goes to, you know, what you're talking about, uh, wife or other family member, uh, and such crime was a third degree felony. Um, I, I think you need to look at it and be okay. certain of it, but I, but I think that's the provision that would come into play. Maybe this, maybe, uh, this is not an issue at all. But, and if, if you think an instruction is appropriate, draft something for me. But. Thanks, sir. Anything else? Um, so how are we doing time-wise, Mr. Fuchs? Uh, a little bit behind schedule, but not much, and we may go for it probably tomorrow. I think we'll be all right. We're still in the two and a half, three-day range, so we are even with the door. Yeah. Okay. Mr. White? Um, I anticipate having all my, I contact my witnesses, and even the ones traveling, which I'll be here Thursday morning. We would not anticipate being in the defense case tomorrow, based on where we are. Now. Right, right. Certainly not tomorrow, maybe. I mean, it would look like uh, sometime Thursday, the, probably, right? Yes, sir. If I got my dates right. So now you get the trials and the days escape you, but um, yeah. So sometime Thursday, I would think we'd be into the defense case. Yes, sir. That's, that's what I anticipate, Ron. Okay. All right. Anything else? If not, we'll see y'all 8.30 tomorrow morning. Yes, sir. Right. Uh, who's we've got the evidence worked out tonight? Of course, there's not much of it. I think you could probably just, uh, you, uh, you're just going to stick the. What are you going to do with the evidence? Okay. Not much. Not much to it. But.